I want to see you. <clears throat> Open the eyes of my heart, Lord. Open the eyes of my heart. I want to see. I want to see you. To see you high and lifted up, shining in the light of your glory. Pour out your power and love as we sing. Holy, holy, holy. High and lifted up, shining in the light of your glory. Amen. Pour out your power and love as we sing. Holy, holy, holy. Amen. You love him. see him, don't you? And remember now the announcements this coming Saturday is Bible study. And as far as right now, we found that for Brother Vernon is as of now not going to be able to come and be with us. So, you know, that's called off. Uh, may try later. I don't know. I hadn't got to talk to Brother Ernie yet to get to exact details, but uh, he's not coming uh, right now. So remember that part. Amen. Any other announcements? We are... and all of the announcements have been made. If you like turning your scriptures, turn to first Peter one and second Peter one. Amen. Okay. Bible yeah. Bible study this coming Saturday, six o'clock. Okay. Father, we thank you for this day and your love father. And thank you for your grace and understanding of each one of us. Thank you for you. We just ask you that you would guide each one, that you'd allow us to understand you, Lord, and to walk in your grace and forgive our sins and keep us, Lord, because that's the part that we need more than anything. And just teach us thine understanding because in that is where we, Lord, we're failing to walk in you as we see you unfold. So just help us to settle ourselves down and get into that channel of what we're supposed to, as the prophet said, to where we can move on upward in you. And just let your loving grace be with each one. We love you and we thank you. Remember the sick ones among us. Just touch each one in Jesus' name. <clears throat> First Peter. Seeing ye have purified your souls in obeying the truth through the Spirit unto unfeigned love of the brethren, see that ye love one another with a pure heart fervently, being born again not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible by the word of God, which liveth and abideth forever. All right. How is the new birth? What brings it to pass? The birth of the word then what would be anything from there would be the growth or understanding or development into the word. So now we go to second Peter. Simon Peter, servant and apostle of Jesus Christ to them that have obtained like precious faith with us through the righteousness of God and our savior, Jesus Christ, grace and peace be multiplied unto you through the knowledge of God and of Jesus, our Lord. According as his divine power hath given unto us all things that pertain unto life and godliness through the knowledge of him that hath called us to glory and virtue, whereby are given unto us exceeding great and precious promises that by these you might be partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. And beside this, giving all diligence, add to your faith virtue, to virtue knowledge, and to knowledge temperance, and to temperance, patience, and to patience, godliness, and to godliness, brotherly kindness, and to brotherly kindness, charity. You may be seated. The Lord add his blessing to the reading of the word. Amen. Now, 
I kind of want to, you know, I done it in there one time and kind of injected a thought in to uh, what we were talking about. And that's kind of what I want to do tonight and kind of place it in the right order uh, to where that we can follow the things because uh, I enjoy seeing things from many different avenues in the Word of God. I enjoy that. I love to read and study it, and that's what we've been doing, see, is taking like the stature of a perfect man, going through that, through the virtues and the things, showing the growth development, showing the, the stages of our Christian journey, and uh, then we picked up adoption along the way, and, uh, you know, bringing that in to show that Peter and, and Paul were both preaching the same thing, that adoption is the same thing as the stature of a perfect man. You know, I remember a man one time saying, he said, oh, he said, that adoption is simple. But said, that stature of a perfect man is deep. Well, to me, it's the same thing. I mean, it's the growth development of a Christian. It's showing our journey in, in through life and, and do it. And that's, that's what I want to emphasize a little bit right here to start with. No, uh, we're not trying to find something new or anything like that. The prophet didn't do those things. But the channel and the way to uh, come to uh, the stature of a perfect man or adoption or anything like that, it was lost down through the time. Now, not lost to where that it went away, that nobody didn't talk about it or, or nothing like that. It, it's... Uh, it's kind of like uh, the prophet, as we'll get to it in a minute, where he says the, the baptism of the Holy Ghost is so incorrectly taught. Well, see, then uh, we must come back to his teachings of that and, and, and all of that way. And that's the way that I've always tried to bring it, see, is to bring what he had to say and bring to our understanding to, you know, follow the word of God. All right. Now, uh, it didn't, when we talk about that, the, uh, uh, the cacum worm, palm worm, locust, caterpillar, etc., ate down the tree and the things like that. The prophet is not talking about that. It ate the pages out of the Bible and we don't have that to where we can read or anything like that. We still got the same, uh, from the time of bringing it, we've got the same Bible, you know, in, in our, are laying out before us, all right? So it's not something to where that those things were eaten away that they could not be read, but the understanding, you know, the, the part of to where that we could follow it and have it revealed to us and know what it's saying, all right? See, then when the prophet came along to try to explain those things to us, that's why it's made it so hard for us to uh, follow, you know, or to, uh, to walk in, in that word and follow it because it does sometimes sound a little contrary one to the other, our, our thoughts and ideas. But remember now that we're studying the part of the prophet coming to bring us the word. That's the main point because that way, where it's not what we think. See, we think it's this, we think it's that. It's been taught by mankind, as we'll get to it in a minute, that the prophet says the baptism has been taught. He said people teach it as water baptism, meaning you're saved. Or they preach it as this is being saved or that is being saved. And he said those things are not right. But that's been taught by mankind till you go across the land today to the churches and the thing. Uh, until you would find, as I said there one time, if we got, you know, uh, I don't know how many thousand denominations there are now. It used to be 969. Well, if you did, you'd have 969 different versions. You remember that back um, a few months ago, trying to express something from it, that we would have that many different versions of the new birth. Well, it can't be that confusing, you know. It can't be to that point, you know, somewhere there has to be truth and, and we should 
have enough natural things, you know, to follow in the Word of God until we can actually see the spiritual from it now because of the opening of the Word in the last days that's been brought to us, all right? So we're not trying to uh, correct the denominations and their teachings, not trying to correct this, that, or the other. It's us that needs the correction, right? It's us as what we call, you know, the end time people. We're the ones the prophet brought the message to. The message is not to the, you know, it's not to the denominations. It is if they'll accept it, yes. It is if they'd receive it, but no, they won't do it. So it's not for that, it's for the bride. All right? See, then, then you can say, well, it's for the bride and the church. It is if they'll accept it, but they're not going to accept it, and you know that. All right, so it leaves it to word being to the bride. Well, then how many of the bride? I've got some, as I wrote down through here, uh, I wrote it like this. Uh, what do you believe? You know, and I'll try to get some thoughts in there and just ask you, what do you believe? You say, well, I believe this, I believe that. Well, is it what the prophet believed? Now, if it's not, we're not following the prophet. Well, well, who can say who's what? Well, we've got the books and the tapes. At least we can we can stay somewhere in the ballpark, you know, the old saying goes. Well, at least to have a few things. And like I've always said, you say after 50 years, oh, well, they just, oh, y'all are just a bunch of smart Alex. Well, you ought to be pretty smart after for 50 years studying one message. Right? I mean, it's not studying all the denominations and their ways and their ideas. And if you're trying to do that, that's, that's not the Word of God. Right, it's to study the message. Right. Yeah, we should have no problems with our understanding, and it ought to be to the basis of laying down our thoughts and taking what he's saying. Right, all right. But our problem is we want a little bit about what our thoughts and a little bit about his thoughts and a little bit about this, a little bit about it, and it gets all confusing. Yes, all right? See, because that would be where it would wind up. All right. We made, as I said, uh, a, a little inroad with the adoptional series into what we were talking about to give you two avenues of looking at the Bible as to what it's trying to bring. The one avenue would be from Peter, see, in First Peter, that I keep reading that, being born again, you know, showing that you need a new birth, and then showing that you need a growth development or going to have it because you're being born again. Then we go over to Second Peter, and we pick up how that is done by add to your faith, virtue, knowledge, temperance, patience, God. All right. See, then we are following that through what we see in the Word. Okay? Then we took the, the point of a adoption to understand adoption in the basis that, you know, in the natural adoptions of the land and the different things, uh, you got all kind of situations. But Paul in Romans defines adoption, Romans 8. And he brings us to the new birth, as Wade was bringing out the other day. See, he br he, Paul brings it to the new birth, showing us that you know, that we're adopted by the new birth. Amen. See, you and I were totally out of it. We're not something in lineages, Amen. all right? Now, if you're going to go with adoption, see, you can only go to the Jews. Right. Now, you understand that? Right. I mean, everybody, are you in this, see, do I need to get to Scripture? See, adoption pertained to Israel, right. Paul says. Right. Why? Because they were to be the chosen people. It had nothing to do for us because we were Gentiles, all right? So then the Jew could take the natural studying of the uh, adoption and see how the, the, the baby was adopted, you know, when it was born into the family. It become a part of the family. Then it would grow development and up to the, the growth development to come out to, to where it would have the, the, the things of God or the things of the man and be adopted into the natural family. All right? And see, but, but us Gentiles, we had no connection. That's right. 
So don't even try to put us with the Jews in adoptions or anything. Bring it to what Paul <clears throat> is bringing it in Romans 8, where he's talking about, you know, the adoption, all right? And then whereby we cry, Abba, Father, okay? Then it comes on down to the second stage of adoption, to the manifestation of the sons and daughters of God, all right? Then it comes down to the last stage of adoption, to wit, to understand the redemption of the body, all right? So Peter's saying the same as Paul, and Paul is saying the same as Peter. Now, in a few minutes, we're going to pick up, because I like it, uh, what is it, Deuteronomy uh, 17, 16, uh, where the, there's about three scriptures there that tells you, you know, that in the mouth of two or three witnesses, that everything be established. So you, in the Old Testament times of doing, the, you know, it, if he was up to a murder case, that's what it actually says in Deuteronomy, uh, if he were, had something of trying somebody for murder, it can't be by one witness. It's got to be two or three witnesses. See, one witness is just you saying the same thing as the other person saying, you know, arguing with each other. All right. But see, in the mouth of two or three witnesses, let everything be established. Well, all right, we used adoption. We used the statue of a perfect man. Now we want to review just a little bit and then we want to pick up a third stage in the Bible of showing us the things that we need to know. And what is the things we need to know? See, sure, we need to know that we need to be born again. We need to know that. All right. But we need to know adoption. We need to know that. We've studied it. All right. Then we need to know for a surety, how all of that will climax in the family of God that are brought into the position to where they're supposed to be, you know, all of us together in Christ. All right? And see, then it would come out to show us uh, who we are and what's taking place. Because that's the main thing. The main thing is what? What the prophets say? When the bride realizes who she is, and what she's here for. Amen. He said she'll be an invincible army. Right. right? When she realizes that. All right. That's all I'm trying to do is get you and I to realize who we are and what's taking place. All right. See, then taking things and showing it from the Bible that if we can show something in the mouth of two or three witnesses, we ought to at least try to listen to that point to see that that's what God has tried to bring to all of us. But now listen, Brother Branham says on the blasphemous names, they can pull that up if they want to, but he says the Holy Spirit is not correctly taught. Right. No. And he calls it Holy Spirit and the baptism. It's taught. But he says it's not correctly taught. Mm -hmm. Well, now, what is he meaning? It's not correctly taught. It's not truth. It's partial truth. It's our own thoughts and ideas coming into that to try to uh, tell what we believe. Well, see, it's not correctly taught. See, now he says that's, there's so much confusion today about the Holy Spirit. It's not correctly taught. I believe the baptism is taught. He said, just like an automobile, you know. You got so many parts and things. All right. And see, each church has its own basis of the doctrine of the new birth. All right? Now, come into the message, people. What is it? If you believe what I preach, they put the new birth on the basis of who, who's who. What camp are we in or what's going on, you know? Brother so-and-so says it's this way because he hunted and fished with the prophet. Well, Amen. Amen for that. I mean, I would have loved to have been able to have done that. But I wasn't able to. But there's one thing about it. I have the message that I can study. And we asked Brother Branham, and we've done that over and over, say, Brother Branham, what is, what is the new birth, Brother Branham? Christ the mystery of God revealed what he said. He said it's the revelation of Jesus Christ personally to you. The revelation of Jesus Christ personally to you. It's not to me, to you. It's not this, that. It's not from Brother Branham to me and you. Now that gets, 
chili seed because you think you're going wrong. No, it's not that way. Brother Branham could tell you what he believed the new birth was. Right. I'd rather have that than anybody else yeah. now. Right. I'd rather have that than have my own because I had to get rid of mine to accept what he said. Right. Now, there's where the trouble's at. We haven't gotten rid of our thoughts. We've gotten rid of it enough until we kind of hang with the message and say, yeah, but then when he says something, we just go ballistics with his thinking and, and you know, and we can't keep it straight. But he said it's so mistaught. Right, right. See? All right. See, then the truth is there. He taught the truth. But how do you think the people felt in the day that he was teaching it? About one we'll read in a minute where he's talking about now we've, we've went along with each other so far and he's preaching at the Branham Tabernacle. He said, we've, we went along so far, but he said, now I, I don't know from here on. Telling his own church. What about it? telling his own church. And he said, we have this and we have that. He said, Branham Tabernacle, this is what we need. Well, he wasn't out bragging, rest of them's wrong, or, you know, all that out there is wrong, but we're right. No. He held it pretty straight, didn't he? But now listen. He said that's, the Holy Spirit has been so incorrectly taught all right? Now, then what would be the, uh, you know, how are we going to determine the truth? Well, we just take what the prophet said. Well, you know, that's kind of in a day now when there's a whole lot of things falling apart that says this is what the prophet said and everything else, right? Uh so then maybe we need to listen and think about and consider ourselves. Amen. What do you think about the word of God? Can it be so confusing? What, what has caused it to be that the prophet would have to say that the baptism of the Holy Spirit has been incorrectly taught? You know what happened? It's been incorrectly taught. Exactly right. you know, is that enough? You know, I mean, you say, well, that's stupid, Brother Dale. And we all, well, that gets the point across. If he said it's been incorrectly taught, it's been incorrectly taught. That's right. Amen. All right. Amen. Now, that, that sensible doesn't need a revelation. All right. But see, we've been through some things that we covered through the message. All right. And he says, it's not correctly taught. I believe that the baptism is taught. See? And when you talk about the baptism of the Holy Spirit, there's a lot that goes with it. All right. Now, where are you going to find uh, in the religious world a true understanding of the new birth? There can only be one place, and that's in this message, Amen. right? Is that, is that all right? It's in this message. So it's the message part that we're concerned about. We're not concerned about everything else, right. all right? But what about when a prophet would make statements see, and say things like this one? We went through this one. Go ahead to number two there, brothers. We're brother around talking about you must be born again. Now, let's see if it has been so incorrectly taught. What do you think about this statement? I suppose maybe there's just a little different. He's talking about, okay. And I'm saying this, I know it's going on tape, and I want to say this to the pastors that will perhaps receive this tape. I suppose maybe just a little different from what the regular church teaches it. Now, what does he teach that the regular church don't teach. First off, he teaches the truth. 
All right, is, is that all right? Well, look, look what he says. I teach and believe, and believe can significantly prove by the Scripture that you're born of the Spirit and then baptized into the body by the Holy Spirit. Now, do you believe that? I'm just seriously asking you. Do you believe that? That's what he said he believed. Well, now, anywhere else, unless we get a personal, or what we'd say, a point about him saying it, you know, unless we find something where he corrects things, we're supposed to believe what he tells us. Now, if he corrects it, all right, that's easy. Well, I got a quote where, okay, let's hold on. Let's see if the quotes work. Let's see if it'll stay. Look, and he's going to explain now why people have so many different thoughts and ideas about the new birth. Look at it. And many of them teach, now he's telling you what he believed, you're born of the Spirit and then baptized into the body by the Holy Spirit. And many of them teach that just to come up and recognize recognized before the congregation and so forth as a sinner that you want to accept Christ as personal Savior, that that is the new birth. That's what many believe. Many believe that water baptism is the new birth. And some of them believe that, that you're born to the water when you're baptized into the water. And there are so many different versions of it, lots of them. Many believe that to recite a, recite a creed and believe on a, on a doctrine of a church, just accept, say, I believe in the holy <laughs> church thing. That's what man teaches of the new birth. Right. All right. And like I said, then you take, if there is a thousand different denominations, you've got a thousand different ways of seeing the new birth. There's just a few different versions that he defines as to doing, all right? But he said, I believe and can prove that you're born again and then baptized into the body. Well, do you believe that? You know, can you put your whole heart on that? Can you get up in front of somebody and say, this is what I believe? How about it? Would we be willing to do that? <clears throat> Go ahead to number three. Why are people so tossed about? I believe that you believe unto everlasting life. I believe that. That your acceptance of the Lord Jesus gives you everlasting, eternal life when you believe it, then I believe by one spirit, then we're baptized in by one spirit. You're baptized into the body of believers. Now, do you believe that? Well, so you can take that and make him say just about anything you want to, but go ahead and think about it now. Now, look, he said, Paul said, passing through the upper coast of Ephesus, finding certain disciples, he said, have you received the Holy Ghost, Holy Spirit, since you believed? Now, do you get eternal life when you believe? What were the people that the Paul talked to, they were believing unto, right. but did not possess Amen. eternal life. Nope. Right? right. Amen. But they were believing unto. Yep. Did they have it right? Did they have eternal life in their soul? Well, yeah, he says, well, 
Go ahead with number four. Questions and answers on Hebrews. But now as far as having eternal life and being a Christian, you are a Christian the moment you believe. Well, is that Baptist? I believe. Is that what you believe? I believe what he says. Because listen to what he says. And that's not make believe. Huh? So no matter what you're reading on this other one back up here where you'd say, well, you know, you believe unto everlasting life. See, then it's not just a mental believing. It's got to be something different. Why? Because now he's explaining that. That's not make believe. That's truly believe on the Lord Jesus and accept him as your personal savior. You're born again right there and have eternal life. God comes into you. Now, we have the answer. Believing unto is a wonderful thing. If you'll keep on believing, it'll turn out to be what you're supposed to be wanting it to be. Uh -huh. So then what he's saying when he says that I can prove that you're born of the spirit and then baptized into the body. Uh -huh. Now, I'm asking you the question, which one is the new birth? When you're born to the Spirit, is that the new birth? Well, then what is that being then baptized into the body by the Holy Spirit? I've been through this over and over and over it for months and months trying to express it to you. Do we really believe the prophet? Are we willing to lay down all of our thoughts and accept what he says? Well, that sounds like the taste that you got two different things there. But you see, that's where we don't follow the prophet. Go back to blasphemous names where we're given at a moment ago. And look what he says. He says, you're birthed into this, into this, into this, into this, into this. Birthed into it. How many new births do you have? You only have one new birth. But there's many, as I was trying to bring out the other day, you have one filling of the Holy Spirit, but there's many fillings of the Holy Spirit. See, so mankind had lost the channel whereby the truth of understanding what the new birth is and how that it can be that you can receive eternal life by believing on the Lord Jesus Christ, truly believing now, not making believe in or have, you know, haphazardly, but you're believing unto eternal life. And that puts you into the body of Christ but then the stature of a perfect man baptizes you into the body for gifts and things. Right? See, then how many new births do we have? Each one of these, the prophet says, you're birthed into this, you're birthed into this, birthed into this, birthed into this, birthed into this. What does it mean? A birth means a coming forth in two. All right? And see, as I said, then there were many fillings in the Bible. They received the Holy Ghost, but then they'd gather together and they'd receive a refilling. Right. Did that mean they didn't have the Holy Ghost and then they finally got the Holy Ghost? No, it's a refilling. Amen. It's the growth development of journeys of Christian through, through Jesus Christ into each one of us that you're being born again. 
That's what Peter was talking about. Being born again. Well, I got the Holy Ghost when I, when I, when I, I don't, see, now you're doing the same thing as I said a while ago, the prophet said people do it. So you say, well, I got the Holy Ghost when I come in this message. Well, now are you doing that like the others were saying it, that it's a baptism or that it's a this or is it that? What is it? When can you say that you really know you were born again? Because if you don't know when you were born again, you can't know no, nothing about a growth development. But that was what was lost. The new birth. Now listen to what I'm trying to explain. Come on. As far as talking about being born again, the new birth and the time, that wasn't lost during the ages. Each church taught that during the ages. Even though Luther would come out to, to preach and to just shall live by faith, that was still talking about the new birth. But what had been lost? Sure, it was lost to what you're believing. Yes. But what was really lost in the ages? The stature of a perfect man. The fact that we need these virtues. See, because we think, well, we, we got it. We're born again. We got it. And we got all these virtues. We got it. Well, see, then that's holding us here. Amen. That's what's kept us here for 50 years that God is trying to get his word to us Amen. since the going away of the prophet. Amen. To get us to settle down to what we believe and how the word is true. Right. But you see, we know for a certainty that you have to be born again. That was never lost. It was not lost in the ages that you needed to be born again. It was lost into the route or way or what do you want to say? The way that is to take place was lost. Yeah. Because then churches come out of it saying it's because you believe. Or it's because you shout. Or it's because you cry. Or it's because you're this, because of that. And none of that is the new birth. There's no new birth just because you shouted or cried or whatever. You've got to make the new birth as something that takes place. Then you get to shouting. Then you get to speaking in tongues. Then you get the things. Get the baby here first. To the new birth. But see, how do you believe? Because that's exactly what he's saying. See, what's he saying in the statement before when he says, I can conclusively prove by the Bible that you are born again and then baptized into the body. Right. <laughs> so you can't add it to where that you're adding a different stage to it. The progressiveness of the, of the Holy Ghost coming into you and I. See, then you can see that we're truly being born again. Right. Hmm? We say, well, well, but Brother Dale, you just so confuse us because you, you, the way you talk. Why? We read what a prophet had to say. Right. He said, I can prove it. Do we believe it that way? Amen. No, I, I believe you're born again, you know, and, and, and I don't know about these other, well, see, what was eaten away was the stature of a perfect man. The adoption. The deeper teachings. I've heard adoption taught in the Baptist church. Come on, church. Well, see, we try to make it with our own thoughts and ideas or something and not realizing we're doing the same thing that mankind has always done. We're taking our idea, put it together with a prophet to try to make it come out to something that we can comprehend. You don't need to comprehend the new birth. You need to die to yourself and accept Jesus Christ as your Savior. There ain't no comprehending. 
Comprehending comes after you get the new birth. Right? Before then, you only got mental comprehending. See, and that's why you can't lay it on that. You can't lay it on to just say, I got it when I believe. Are you following me? Not make believing, but when you truly believe, God comes, I read it to you, the prophet said, God comes and lives in you. And it's on down below there, he said he makes you a new creature. Huh? Well, I, I just don't understand how that you, you, you talk about that. Well, have I said anything that he didn't say? Did I? I mean, have we read what he's saying? I didn't make the statement. He's the one that said it. I can prove. What? I teach and believe and believe can sufficiently prove by the scripture that you're born to the spirit and then baptized into the body by the Holy Spirit. See, this is back in 62. And he was teaching the stature of a perfect man. So what are you being done as these virtues come forth? We are being baptized into the body by the opening of God's word. It's being born again, as Peter says. Why can't we see it that way instead of, well, I've done had a new birth. What I need anymore? A certain person one time, we were talking about sanctification. They said, I've been sanctified. I don't need to hear nothing about no sanctification. Said, well, okay. That's your problem, ain't mine. I guess you're flat, go all the way through the Bible, on out through the seals and on up and everything else, through the, all the way to the future home. We're believing in sanctification because it don't stop. See, that's what I've tried to get you to see. Your new birth don't stop. It's not just one lump, some bloop. See, that's what we want it to be. It's just one bloop. I got it. I got it. I got it. Instead of a growth development. And how would you have your children here under that form? We have to grow into that. We have to grow into him. Is that according to the scripture? Uh -huh. And what does he say? But now as far as having eternal life and being a Christian, you're a Christian the moment you believe. Well, that's Baptist doctrine. Well, then you argue with him. He, I just read it. Is he teaching Baptist doctrine? If he is, why is he saying it's a little contrary to everybody else? Right? Maybe another message, but that's what he said, right? Why would he always, people was, was against him in what he was teaching? Because he's teaching things they didn't understand. Right? Amen. Eternal life when you believe it, then I believe by one spirit you're baptized into the body of believers. Huh? Then we clarified it by what he's saying. Not make believe, but truly believe on the Lord Jesus and accept him as your personal savior. You're born again right there and have eternal life. God comes into you. Now is he teaching something that doesn't sound the way that we used to believe or is he so confused? Well, I can show you later where he said this. Well, okay, you're in that category of what? The prophet was missed it here and missed it there and I found where he missed it. Well, just glory, hallelujah, go on with your little pity patter. We don't come around here pity pattern. We talk plain, don't, 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 Come around here to try to bring ideas like something like that because we ain't got no room for it. Right. See? See, not make believe, 
truly believe. But it's passed from death unto life. You're a new creature right then. A new creature. What about it? Then why is it so confusing to try to understand a simple thing of the new birth? Now listen, it wouldn't be confusing if everybody believed the new birth is the birth of the word. Oh, yeah, okay. I'm putting it out here. She got it to me. If everybody believes it's the birth of the word, what's, what's the problem? What's the new birth? Birth of the word. What's the new birth? Birth of the word. What did the prophet say the new birth was? Revelation of Jesus Christ personally to you. What's the new birth? Birth of the word. All right. What's the statue of a perfect man built by? The birth of the word. Do you understand what I'm saying? There was never an age that did not have the new birth, faith. That was not taken away. Like my wife always used to say, it was not the baptism of the Holy Ghost that was taken away. It was the word that the bug ate down. And you can only work an amount of word that you have in the baptism of the Holy Ghost can only work in that point. Right. So what is that? See, what was taken away in the dark ages? The teaching of the stature of a perfect man. The teaching of perfection and what it takes to be perfected or perfect. What was taken away? Not the new birth. Every age had the new birth. But they did not have the way to attain to anything further than that new birth. Now, we covered it the other day, trying to get you to see it. Wade's been doing it in the ages and coming down. See that pure, unadulterated word, Brother Brown said, lasted till about the fourth church age. So you can figure that when you're coming up to the fourth age, that you're up in here where Martin and Columba and them was at, and they were teaching the stature of a perfect man. They were teaching adoption. Brother Brown said there was none greater outside the Lord Jesus than St. Martin. Now that's his word. Maybe paraphrasing her, but it's right. Huh? See, because those men had understanding of the truth of the growth development of Christianity. And he said, let's see, who was it, Martin, that they had miracles in every service? I believe that's right. One of those men that we're talking about said they had miracles in every service. Mm -hmm. Why? Because they were Christians, and they weren't just little babies. But they were teaching the babies how to become adults, and that's what Peter was doing. That's what Paul was doing. Trying to bring us to an understanding. Hmm? Well, see, then does it get confusing? I know I'm placing out two or three things in this message tonight that each one I'm demanding for you to think or to make up your mind of what you believe. Do you believe the new birth the way the prophet taught it? That he said, I can prove and, and declare it from the word of God that you're born again and baptized into the body. Well, that looks that looks like two things. It's not two things when you see what it is. One of them brings you into the body. The other one is a growth development. A natural baby is born into the world. It don't get born and born and born after them, but it eats and grows. So is it with a Christian. All right. But see, what was lost was the stature of a perfect man. 
because they knew nothing about that teaching. Oh, that, we, all, we got all these things. We got all these virtues and things. Well, go ahead to number six, number five, excuse me. No. Uh, well, we go to that one. That'll be fine. Three, 299. He says, then, what does it go? Then genuine temperance, genuine patience. See, you're moving right on up the line. You're coming forth into what God wants. So read in between all the different things. Now bring it on up to where we can go to the last. And be ye therefore perfect. What's that? Perfect, even as your Father in heaven is perfect. Now, do we believe that we're perfect? Why do we say, well, I ain't perfect and you ain't either. And God says we're perfect. Yeah. Right? So we're denying what he says. Come on, listen. And look, this is what I like. He's coming up and bringing it up into the virtues. And, I, and look, and it says you got up here now before you're asked to do that. What was that message? What is right back before that? Be therefore perfect, Matthew 548. He says, well, you can't be perfect. He said, oh, yes, you can. He said, because godliness requires the fact that you be perfect. Right? Have we been through the message? And you got way up here now before you're asked to do that. Asked to do what? Asked to be perfect. Before you're asked to understand what perfection really is, you got to grow through faith, virtue, knowledge, temperance, patience, you begin to get into a positional understanding, because we're going to read that one, but then you go to godliness. Growing in grace and knowledge. Growing up to it, then he expects you to understand what it is about perfect. You don't wait till you come up there to be made perfect. You wait to come up there to understand Understand what God has done for you. Amen. You see why, church, look at what I've tried to tell you from the beginning. That's why most people are not going to make it in the change of the body. It's because they've never been taught that they need these virtues. They're scared of the message of anything that you try to direct them into. And I wasn't the one that wrote 327 church age book that you don't like for me to quote where the prophet says what? This messenger of Malachi 4, Luke 17, they're going to do two things. Turn the hearts of the children back to the faith of the Father and reveal the seven thunders, which is a revelation contained in the seven seal. It'll be these divinely revealed mystery truths that literally turn our hearts back. Well, then if, it's, if those things are not preached, our hearts can't be turned back. So we're going to keep going and dying, going by the grave. See, you take it wrong when I try to say things. But look, you got up here now before he asked you to do that. All these things has to be added. Then when you get up here, he asks you now to be perfect. God and his sons and daughters of God. What, coming all the way up to godliness. Now he expects you to understand what godliness is. Right? He expects us to understand that. Now you remember this one, blaspheme his name, go ahead, number six, 277 paragraph, and what did he say? Patience, thing. don't you worry, Satan will court them, count them for you. I'm climbing up the ladder now. Look, I've added virtue, knowledge, temperance. Now I got to add patience. I still ain't got the Holy Ghost. Remember that? Two or three weeks of trying to go through that. What is the prophet saying? I mean, you read what he's saying. What's he saying? You ain't got all the Holy Ghost. Right? That's what he's saying. You ain't got all of it. 
What's he saying? You ain't got it? No, he done told you you got the Holy Ghost in the new birth of faith. He done told us what we got, the new birth, and how that it makes us perfect, but we don't have the understanding of it because it's so hard for us to believe that we as human beings could be perfect. Well, he puts it at godliness where it's required that we understand being perfect and how we are perfect. I wish to goodness that you'd take my advice and do one thing, that if you would listen or read Hebrews chapter 5 and 6, especially one verse 5 and 6, and read all the things the prophets said about some things, because we're fixing to get on to that. See? Do you understand? The new birth wasn't lost. It was the growth development in Christianity of trying to come to the stature of a perfect man. It was the teachings of Peter and them. The teaching of Paul of adoption. That was what was lost in the dark ages. They everyone had the new birth. You know, it was a birth for that age. Come on, read the message, brother, around and preach the whole message on what? Holy Ghost of each age. There was no age without the baptism of the Holy Ghost, which was eternal life. So what was lost? The growth development of Christianity, the teachings of growth development, the teachings of what we have need of. And look what he says. He says, you come up here to patience. Look at the pyramid, patience. He said, you ain't got the Holy Ghost yet. That's caused a doctrine in this message that we faced years ago. He said, see there, you ain't got the Holy Ghost yet. Well, that's exactly right. I never got down to reading all of the scripture I want to read in Peter, but we're going to get to it. How about this scripture? Add to your faith, virtue, knowledge, temperance, patience, godliness, Verse 8 says, if these things be in you and abound, they make you that ye shall neither be barren nor unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. If these virtues be in you. But what about the next one? What about verse 9? But he that lacketh these things is blind and cannot see afar off and hath forgotten that he was purged from his old sins. He that lacketh these things. Hmm? What about that being written to Christians now? Uh oh. How is a Christian blind and cannot see afar off? He that lacketh these things is blind. I ain't quoting, I'm reading the Bible, right? Right. right? See, we're not through yet with the statue of a perfect man. We're just getting started. We ain't got to that scripture. We think about having these things, but when he says we don't have them, we can wind up being blind. But what if you got one of these things? What if you got the new birth? You're not blind. Now, this is talking to Christians, right? You're not blind. Yeah, but what, what do you mean? I mean just what the scripture says. He that lacketh these things is blind. If we don't have them, we're blind and cannot see afar off. I don't care how much you claim to believe the prophet's message or what we holler and scream. We're blind. Well, what if we have one of these virtues called faith? Then it's not talking about us. Oh, glory, the day I saw that, I done some shouting of my own. And I wrote it in my Bible. If I have one of these things, I don't lack them. 
so I'm not blind. Thank you, Lord. There is an ability to move on because I'm not blind. See, we blind our own selves. All right. Now, we've been through this on Ephesians 4. Let's go to number 7. We've been through this about the stature of a perfect man and about the, the disciples and how what they were to be, all right? But now we're going to approach it just a little bit stronger because we're going to Ephesians 4 and 11. And he gave some apostles, some prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers. For the perfecting of the saints, now, if you want me to read it, I'll give it in a minute. Brother Ryan said the fivefold ministry was for the perfecting of the saints. You say, well, he said, well, bring me what he said. I want to see where Brother Branham says that his, that Brother Branham was for the perfecting of the saints. I want to see that now. I'm serious. I'll come right back here and call your name and say you corrected me. Because I've studied the message. I can't find it. Without this message, the fivefold ministry don't have anything to bring. I preached that to you from day one. We don't have a message. Fivefold ministry don't have them. It's to take this message and break it down to the people. Yeah, right. right? Yeah. Come on. But look, for the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ, what? Till we all come in the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God unto a perfect man, unto the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ that we henceforth be no more children tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine by the slight of men and cunning craftiness whereby they lie in wait to deceive. But speaking the truth in love may grow up into him in all things, which is the head. Now, the prophet brought the message of our full ministry supposed to break it down for us. Of course, that's why most people don't believe in the fivefold ministry. And I've told you, I don't have no problem. There's a lot of people call themselves fivefold ministry. I ain't going to listen to it. And I get sick of sometimes hearing some of the people y'all listen to and wonder, well, why, where in the world did you miss that hat? I ain't saying you can't listen to nobody. I ain't never taught nothing like that. But you, you, you spend your time listening to something like that. Yeah. See, I wonder what's going on. All right. But you see, that ain't where I want to stop. That we may grow up in him in all things. Go to number eight. First Peter 2 and 1. Wherefore, laying aside all malice and guile and hypocrisies and envies and all speaking. As newborn babes desire the sincere miracle of the word that we may grow thereby. We're all born babies in Christ and must grow up in him. Okay, go to the next. 2 Peter 3 and 18, but grow in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and say, grow into it. We've got to have a growth development. That's the stature of a perfect man. But now listen. Now let's get to what we're going to get to. I told you we had two things we brought. We brought stature of a perfect man from Peter. We brought adoption from Paul. Now let's take the third one to anchor it into the doing. And then you'll see that what I do a lot of times, I tell you, I just sometimes I lay these things aside and then I wait till the time to come. So now in the mouth of two or three witnesses, let's see if we can get another witness out of the Bible that mankind has never understood the Word of God. He tries to make it say what he wants it to say. He has it in his own concept or thought. And thereby he's had a thousand different denominations and he's had a thousand different ways of the new birth, and there's 10,000 of them in this message. Huh? Okay. Go ahead to number nine. Hebrews 5. Of whom we have many things to say and hard to be uttered, seeing you're dull of hearing. He's talking about Melchizedek. Come on, okay. For when for the time you ought to be teachers, you have need that one teach you again, which be the first principles of the oracles, which is the word, oracles, law, word, of God, 
and are become as such as have need of milk and not of strong meat. Now, what about somebody, uh, what about a situation where somebody has grown up a little to get past the milk, but then they go back to the milk? Is that what it's saying? For when the time you ought to be teachers, you have need that one teach you again, which be the first principles of the oracles of God, and are become such as have, as have need of milk and not of strong meat. What about somebody strong enough to think they're away from milk, but then they have to go back to milk? Is that what Paul's saying? In other words, Paul's saying going back to the very principles. The word principle means beginning. Right? Now watch what he say. Everyone that uses milk is unskillful in the word of righteousness, for he is a baby. But strong meat belongs to them that are of full age, even those who by reason of use have their senses exercised to discern both good and evil. Roll to the next. Therefore, leaving the principles of the doctrine of Christ. Let us go on unto perfection. Not laying again the foundation of repentance from dead works and of faith towards God. Of the doctrines of baptisms and of laying on of hands and a resurrection of the dead and eternal judgment. And this we will do if God permit. There's number three. Therefore, leave in the principles. What is the principles? The beginning. All right? The beginning. Principles. Let us go on to perfection. So now Paul is still right into the basis of where he brought out and Peter with godliness as to be in perfection. Right? Did not Paul bring it out and Peter bring it out of perfection? Did not Peter talk about it? Didn't Brother Brown on the statue of a perfect man talk about what? You come all this way now and God expects you to be perfect. Where? Up to godliness. Here's another example in the word of God. Number three, therefore leaving the principles. Now, how do you leave principles? In Christian terminology, what is your promise? Why well, I ask you to read Hebrews 5, 6, and 5 and 6 is one of our 5 and 6 and 6 of the Hebrew series. Or listen to the tape. You hear him explain what principles and things are. Now, what is Paul saying? Therefore, leaving the principles. Does that mean we do away with them? Does that mean that you just forget all of it? And we just holler how perfect we are. What does that mean? How can you leave the principles and go on? How many of you can ride a bicycle? Probably just about everybody in here at one time or other could ride a bicycle. Now, how about doing me a favor when you get home? Forget about how to ride it and get on it and take off. Therefore, leaving the principles of the doctrine of Christ, let us go on to perfection. Well, why don't you jump on the bicycle and take off? You know yourself that it depended upon that human brain that has been so set until it's a fact that it's not Having to, you don't have to think about pedal. You don't have to think about moving. You don't have to talk about leaning. You don't have to, it's all mechanically involved within you as a human being that you never forget from the time you're five years old of learning to ride a bicycle and the time you get to be 80 years old. You may get a little doddly, but you can still ride it. Right? Now that's leaving the principles. What? What is leaving the principles? Principles means the beginnings. I can give you the definition of the word. It's in 
of what principles mean. And we're supposed to leave the principles. How do you leave principles, but yet keep those principles as the very foundation of what you're doing? Is Paul saying, all right, now let's forget about all the apostles that's taught and let's go on to perfection. Is that what he's saying? No, no. But what was Paul facing? You'll find Brother Branham explaining this if you'll read and listen. You got every time for everything else. Why don't you read and listen? You'll find Paul saying, you have made so much on this beginnings until you're not going on. That's what he was meaning when he said, therefore, leaving the principles. Because if you stayed with the principles, what's wrong with staying with the principles? Brother Branham, I got it laying here. Do you need them? Where Brother Branham said, we've got to stay with the principles. What are the principles, the beginnings? Well, do you realize then I've also got it right in here, laying, we'll get to it in a minute, that Paul calls it carnal reform? Brother Branham calls it carnal reform for us to stay with something and not move on. You see what went wrong? What was took away during the ages was the ability to come to perfection or to understand leaving the principles. And Brother Branham said Paul was speaking to the, to the children of Israel when he was saying those things. That they had got away from the principles or wanted to stay with the principles, we'll put it that way, and not go on in perfection. Principles was all the Old Testament and what it spoke of. When Paul stood there talking about the principles to make us something to go on to perfection, he's talking about the whole entire Old Testament background to bring him to that place. And he says, now let's leave this and go on. Leave it. Like getting away from it? No. See, that's where the carnality of your mind will run it. I didn't say that. You can't stop your principles. Your principles are always there. Your beginnings cannot be done away with. Because if you'd done away with your beginnings, you'd have to go back to that. That's what Paul's explaining. See, those Jews laid on those principles. And Paul was saying all of those principles spoke of Jesus Christ. And he's writing, now listen, he's writing to the Hebrews. He's not writing to carnal, unregenerated Israelis. Now we just dropped a bomb, didn't we? Paul is not talking to the unconverted Israelis. He's talking to the converted Hebrews. And said, why do you want to go back to that? All of that spoke of Jesus Christ. Can't you see what he's saying? He said, look, I come to church last week. and said, I heard all about Jesus. Now listen, and don't go carnal on your mind. Listen to what I'm illustrating. Paul said, I come to church last week. And said, all you preached was Jesus was God. I'm quoting Brother Branham out of there. All you're preaching that Jesus was God. You're preaching his name and this, that, and the other. He said, cut out all of that and go on. Go on to perfection. Well, what is going to perfection? We already got Jesus. Knowing all about Jesus, knowing all about this, knowing all about one God, water baptism, no eternal hell. All of those principles. Now I'm going to state it so you can do what you want to. We'll go home. The stature of a perfect man, the faith of the fathers. We can dwell on that so much until all we're doing is making it principles that will not take us on to perfection. The prophet's message was not, was not, the faith of the fathers. He had to come and bring it to restore the faith. But his message begun through the opening of the seals. Come on. So what could Brother Branham stand and say like he says here? Leaving the principles. 
Let us go on to perfection. All right? Let's read. Go to number 17. Hebrews chapter 6. And last Sunday, we taken, leaving the principles of the doctrine of Christ. In the sixth chapter, we read this. Let us go on to perfection. And we found out that the people today in many churches, along with the Branham Tabernacle and different ones, we lay too much on study about the principles of Christ. He was the son of God, a son of Abraham. See, that's what we study on. He was the son of so and so. And on back the genealogies. But the Bible said, let us lay aside those things and go on to perfection. Lay aside all the doctrines that he taught. <laughs> that's not laying something down or throwing it down, right? Because look at the rest of it. First, you must know the doctrine. You can't lay something aside that you don't know. First, you must know the doctrine. Then you must know all these things. Then, lay, then let's lay them aside. Now read Hebrews. We're talking about even the resurrection of the dead. He said of the resurrection of the dead, laying on of hands, baptisms, and all of those dead articles of God. Did we read it? And yet they have no life in them. Come on, I'm reading what he says. Amen. But the church today just goes to those things. Oh, we believe in the deity of, Jesus, of Christ. Yes, we believe in water baptism. Yes, sure, laying on our hands. Paul said we'll do all this if God permits. Mm -hmm. But in the face of all that, Let's lay it aside and go on to perfection. Well, I've asked you to read what he says. You'll find him in our cover and carnal reform as water baptism. Let's see if I can find it. All right. Go to number 13. How many enjoyed the message on perfection? Let us go on to perfection. That was our message this morning in the sixth chapter. We're just getting into a place to, to where we begin to get the real part. Oh, we can all agree upon these things, upon the deity of Christ and him being the son of God and how he was God and God was with him and he was in God. Know how we're going to agree. Excuse me. Uh, he was in God and God in him, so forth. We all agree upon that. But now from here on, I don't know we're going to agree. I didn't say this. Look. Just now from here on, I don't know how we're going to agree or whatsoever it is. He said, I'm going to give you a chance to write me a question from here on. In other words, read what he's saying. Are we to do away? Is therefore leaving the principle? Is that to do away with all those things? No, he said, we've got to know the doctrine. All right. You got to know the doctrine. You got to get that right. But then because you know the doctrine don't mean you got it. Okay. Going down to the next one, 14. Watch this. Let's get this word perfection. Do you know that there's only one way you'll stand in the presence of God? That's perfect. God cannot tolerate unholy things. And you legalist, how could you ever perfect yourself when you have not one thing to perfect yourself with? You were born in sin. Your very conception was sin. The very desire of your being was sin. Unless he goes on to the life and says, unless you're born again, you're lost. Legalist. What's legalism? Hmm? 
What's carnal reform? What's reformations? Now, come on. That's where I say it. Let's see if you keep on agreeing now. As Brother Random said, let's see from now on if you agree. What is carnal reform? Things that you think is what's making you right. Right? You think it's what's making you right because you don't do or you do do. Huh? Come on. What is carnal reform? Things that we think is what's making us right. Yep. right. How many of you sisters think you're right because you don't cut your hair? Yep. When the prostitutes in my day would not cut their hair. That's too blunt, Brother Dale. But it was the truth. You think you don't do this or you don't do that or you do this or do that. Carnal reform. Now listen. Is Brother Branham a contrary to it? He said, let's get the doctrine right. So what is the doctrine? Don't cut your hair. That's just plain language. That ain't a revelation. That's plain language. Don't wear your clothes tight. Women to where that men can look at you and love her. Don't wear your splits that come up in the backs and everything. Don't wear stuff like that. We believe in that. We believe in living right. We believe in being Christians. Right? But let it be because Christ is living in us. Now it's not legalism. It's Christ living in you. But until then, it's a carnal reform. I didn't say it. Your prophet is talking about water baptism and it being right and that no eternal hell and, <clears throat> and the resurrection of the dead. Paul's talking about it. But he calls it reform. Yep. If that's at all we're going to do. Those are just a foundation. Those things that we've, we've got our doctrines anchored. We believe in one God, water baptism, no eternal hell, serpent seed, predestination. We got all of that right. Why? Because we got the prophet's words. All right? But now let's go on to perfection. Well, I don't believe there's nobody can teach me. That's all right. You'll stay in your carnal reform because that's what it is. I don't need nobody to straighten me out. Your carnal reform. Stay in it. That's fine. You go ahead. That's your business. But therefore, leaving the principles. Do you understand what I'm getting at? Number one, we covered the statue of a perfect man. We must have these virtues in us to be Christ in us. A rapture for a bride, a rapture for an individual, et cetera, depends upon these virtues. Paul comes forth in adoption and takes it all the way to wit. And I love that so much until you don't understand how much I love the way he talks. Paul's got it in his talking. People read him and don't understand him. Paul didn't say the change of the body because he couldn't do nothing but prophesy of it. He could prophesy of the change, the different thing, but he could not make it manifest. So he was still hung on that. So he said to wit the redemption of the body to understand these things. It would take a prophet to come then for us to understand these things of the change of the body and the, the things that was to take place. And there was his message that began through the opening of the seals and brought that message. The others was a restoration back to the faith of the fathers. Bringing back to them. Then he stood on that and he looked at Paul and he said, therefore, leaving the principles of the doctrine of Christ, let us go on. Amen. 
Come on, I give it to you there the other day. Read the spoken word and read no seed. Brother Branham laid his message down, preached his message. God told him to pick up his pen to write. In other words, he had his notes written for it. He said, pick up your pen and write. He wrote as he went through, and he, when he come down to the end of it, what did he say? This is right, this is right, all these is right, but says, of, as of yet, Malachi 4 is not fulfilled. So what was Brother Brown saying? Therefore, leaving the principles of all of this background that I've got here of the, stat, of the spoken word of the original seed that he took him six hours to preach, showing where that the word of God had been made manifest again. And he said, in our day and coming, he said, it come through Mary, it come through this, and it's all the birth of the word. Amen. And there he stood on that word. Amen. And God said, as of yet you ain't reached perfection. God said, leaving the principles now of all of these things that you've taught, you've brought us back, brought the people back to the faith of the fathers and understanding. Said, now go on to perfection. What? Seals. Christ's mystery. Future home. Who is this Melchizedek? The unveiling of God. Masterpiece. I've asked you to do it, and I wonder how many people have ever went home and done what I've asked you a thousand times to do. Go home tonight. If you don't have one, we'll try to find you one. Take the book that lists all the tapes, the index book. Get one of them. Turn over to 63 and start with the seals and read from there on to 65. Just the titles of the messages. There's not one title in all of those messages preached after the seals that would be anything outside of bringing and glorifying Jesus Christ except indictment. You might be able to deal with indictment because of what he had to do with indictment. But read them, Christ the Mystery. That's an eighth day message. Feast of the Trumpets. I don't care if, if brother so-and-so, and you want me to call his name, but his brother so-and-so said, Brother Brown said, made so many steps of the tongues in that feast of the trumpet, said you can't understand it. Brother Branham in that message said, it's thus saith the Lord. Now, who do you think I'm going to believe? Huh? So therefore, leaving the principles. I got one more thought to inject, and that's the headstone coming to the church, and then we're going to have to leave the principles. Because all I've taught for months and months has been principles. Principles. Because the faith of the fathers is principles when you're looking at the seals up ahead of you. That's why I've always said, I believed it from the first time I read it, and I believe it today. Those seven seals is a headstone to the church. Now you tell me something else it can be. No, the seven seals is the headstone to the church. Because in the seven seals is marriage and divorce. Am I quoting him? In is serpent seed, about 68 back, or 58 back over here. Everything that's revealed when he come into those seals and it opened to a brand new field. But what was that brand new field? No longer dealing with principles. Brother Branham, from the time he started his message, and come on, do I need to quote Brother Branham like rapture message? Not in the years of preparation. Not one, one of them there says not in the years of the healing campaign. But he said in the time of the opening. It's time, church, we need to start thinking about leaving the principles. That's right. That's right. We ought to have it already settled pretty good about one God, water baptism, no eternal hell, serpent seed, predestinations, and all the things. Now, I'm going to say this part because this is where I always have stood Man sat at my house one day and he was talking about something. 
and he said so and so, and I said, brother, why don't you tell me something about past the future home? I said, you guys think that you're come to take that Brother Branham just swept off the foundation. You got to build a building. I said, start building the building, but start after the future home because Brother Branham preached us to there. And he just drawed up in his seat and hushed because he knew it was the truth. I said, if you think you can straighten Brother Branham out, sweeping it off, that'd be one thing. But when you start trying to say that you go beyond Brother Branham and you're supposed to bring these things, there's no such thing in the Word of God that you're to do something like that. And if you think, Brother Dale, thanks, that the fivefold ministry is to bring something contrary to the prophet, you need to get some principles, human principles. You need to get some beginnings to settle down and listen. I ain't taught 40, 50 years for that. I've taught this message all of these years on the foundation and I stand today. I'll be glad for you to listen to the tapes from 2002 up because we got them. We had them all the way back to ever build, ever tape in this building, but we had to burn them because we didn't have room for them. Check it out and see if I've changed my doctrine. Mm-hmm. I preach the same thing over a lot. Because there's one thing about it, if you keep preaching something over, finally people are going to get to principles. And then we can go on to perfection. What about Brother Brown's message not beginning until 63? The other was a preparation. The other was principles. That he had to get in order and right. Come on, musicians. He had to get all of that right the principles. Then when he got it all right, then the seals broke. Right? After the principles was right. Spoken word, original seed, read it. As of yet, Malachi 4 is not fulfilled. He set out right then to find Malachi 4. He went straight into the opening of the seven seals and carried us right on into the future home. Right? Taking us all the way to the future home. We don't need anybody else to come along so you to do anything. We've got the message. But we need to stop with the... Stop. We need to not get off and lose the principles. We need to let the principles be the thing that holds us up because that's what it's for. What's holding this building up is the foundation that's is underneath it. Don't try to tear the foundation out. You're going to lose everything. I ain't never taught nothing like that. It doesn't come that way. This message is the foundation, but this message is the growth development throughout the stature of a perfect man. And this message didn't come until after the seals broke. The other was a restoration back to the faith of the fathers. Come on, discuss that with me if you want to. Show me where that's wrong. Because, see, I'm going to keep throwing it back to you. You say, well, Brother Brown didn't understand this. Brother Brown didn't understand that. Brother Brown didn't understand this. But when the opening of the seals came, he said, all was made right. He knew right where he was standing. Right? Let's stand. What do we got, brother? What about it? Therefore, leaving the principles. We got number three now. Three things to anchor that there was something lost down through the ages that mankind could not follow and understand. And it wound up to be the message of the disciples. It wound up being the faith of the fathers. Only can we go on when the faith of the fathers is revealed. Until that, we're still in carnal reform. We're trying to convert each other. We're trying to get the women to quit doing this and the men to quit. And ain't it kind of funny? You don't hear much about the men doing wrong. It's always the women doing wrong. 
My mother made a statement years ago and I had to agree with it. She said a woman said she goes out and does one thing wrong, said she's blackballed the rest of her life. Wears an A around her neck in the old days. Now, and said that's the way it's been. But said let a man do anything he wants to. Commit adultery, do anything. Said he puts a tie on, goes to church, he's called a brother. I said, Mom, you're right. Born again. Everybody in this message hollering and beating about the women. We men have the same thing. So let's stop and get away from the principles. Let's get down to just being Christians. Not throwing it away, not doing away. Paul didn't say that. He said, therefore, leaving the principles, let us go on to perfection. Not laying again, not having to go back over that. Come on, that's what he said, not laying again, not going back over these things and over these things and over these things. He said, well, you sure have done that a lot. I sure have. It's about time for us to leave the principles and start marching on and see what God has for us. It's in the Word. We don't have to worry about it. It's there. Somebody's going to catch it, and we'll be out of here. How great is, is our, our God. God. Anybody have a need? How, How great is His, his word. word. He's the greatest one. Has ever been. Still feel good? sister said, said, I have. She's not going to keep it. In Jesus' name, we condemn this coffin. It's all gone away. We love you, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's go confess it. You did have. Father, we condemn these things. and We place the blood over our little sister. You take away these old coffin things in Jesus' name. Amen. Anybody else? Put your trust in me. How great is our God. How great is his word. He's the greatest one that has ever been heard. For he rolled back the water. Our brother's got to be traveling and being... California for a week, so let's just pray God will be with him, all right? Father, in the name of Jesus Christ, we send these prayer cloths, Lord, for you to take care of our brother. And we believe you and we thank you in Jesus' name. Anybody else? You heard our sister trying to get everything set for somebody else, working herself, Lord, and you just be with her. Give her the energy and the courage and things and the wisdom of what to do. But also, Lord, take care of everything there and let it be sold and all be gone in Jesus' name. Anybody else? And he said, I will leave you. Put your trust. Father, we thank you for today and we pray that what we said, Lord, is enough to make us jog a little thought. We got to go on to perfection. Not laying again, not just keep over and over and over these things that we've been over all of these years. 
that we've got them laid out in order, Lord, and we've got the prophet's words and everything, and we should understand it all and praise you for the doing. Now let us move on into the word that we can see you, Lord, walking among us. And guide us now. Take care of everybody on the way home. Give a safe journey in Jesus' name. You're dismissed. How great is our God, how great is his word, for he's the greatest one.